Good morning, team all. Good morning. Revelations 7, verse 9 and 10 says this. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out, cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Let's carry on with this hymn. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Sing over his wonderful love, proclaim. Lord, 
We thank you that for what Jesus went through for us, what he went through on the cross, the suffering he went through to take the punishment for sin, to take our place, to take our punishment as the Lamb of God. He died for our salvation and we thank you for that Heavenly Father. We thank you that we can sing hymns of praise because though in what we might call the cruel misery, there was this hope, there was this eternal salvation. Of, of being revealed before us. May our hearts be ever cheerful. May they be ever blessed. May they be ever wanting to tell of this story, of this love, of the meaning of this love. And Lord, <coughs> Jesus is our eternal hope. For one day we will see him as he is. And be ever thankful of our Lord and Saviour. Be with us here this morning, we pray, as we continue in worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. I think I've got one child here. Was I going to do it? It's, it's not really children's talk as such, but... Have you got your blue Bibles? Some of you may have one. And we'll see what it says on the page, I'll put it down somewhere. Page 943. Or what's opposite 943? What can you see in the picture? It's opposite. Page 943. A donkey. A donkey. An eel. An eel. They're all called Jenny, aren't they donkeys? I think. But, uh, and it looks as if somebody's trying to sit on the donkey. So perhaps we'll read what it says. And we might have to forgive some of the words used here, but uh, right, you going to read it with me? If we can, well, you don't have to bring it out now. But, uh, Jesus was walking to a big city called Jerusalem. He told two of his friends, please go into that village over there and you will see a young donkey tied up near a gate. Untie it and bring it to me. But what if someone asks, what are we doing, they asked. Just tell them that I need to borrow their donkey, Jesus said. So the men went to find it. They put coats on the donkey's back to make it more comfortable for Jesus to sit on. Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. People cheered and laid their coats on the ground to make a carpet. They cut branches from the palm trees at the side of the road and waved them in the air as the procession passed. Now, as I say, this is where we have to excuse it. It says, Hooray for Jesus! <laughs> Everybody shouted. Hooray for the special king God promised to send us. Or, Hosanna for Jesus! Everybody shouting, Hosanna for the special king God promised to send us. And that's perhaps what we, in some ways, remember today. Now, <coughs> I did do a few practice ones at home and they didn't quite work out as well as I had hoped, but. <coughs> If you can find a bit in the middle, give it a slight tug, a slight twist. It's a bit like a 
Carnival, I call it. So there you go, that's my. But there we have that first day, there was a lot of rejoicing, wasn't it? The children singing or shouting upset a few people. The Pharisees said, Do you hear what these, or whoever it was, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise? There they were, shouting, shouting near the, or in the courts of the temple, or nearby, their hosannas. And Jesus knew it was for him, even if the disciples, oh, even if the chief priests didn't. And we should sing our, our, our hosannas as well, shouldn't we? Because it means God saves. And that's what we know Jesus does for us. Let's stand and sing. You are the King of glory. You are the King of peace. <coughs> Sunday, 17th, 10.30 a.m. We're expecting Charles to Lacey in the morning and 10.30 myself at 6 p.m. In between that, we do have our Easter fish and chip social on Saturday the 16th. And uh, if you want to book a place for that, see Sarah Jane. Streets to remember in prayer, the Cedars, the Cross, and Townfield Walk. The UEC Church to remember in prayer is the Word of Corrigan. And the missionary focus this week is MAF, Missionary no, Mission Aviation Fellowship. Often get that wrong, don't I? But uh, yeah, if you pick up one of the newsletters, prayer letters, it tells you how MAF responds to food crisis in southern 
met de kerstje. Bunt die niet van half tot in de eerste kantje leg. Now the Passover, the festival of our leavened bread, were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indifferently to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. This is the word. Time for our time of intercessory prayer. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we read that the prayers of the saints ascend to your throne. They are like sweet, fragrant incense or perfume. Sometimes our prayers perhaps don't smell very nice in that they are woes and fears and worries. But Lord, you want to hear our prayers, our fears, our woes and our worries. You want to hear our praises as well. Lord, may they all ascend to you, to your throne. Lord, may you answer them. In your will we pray. We have many things going through our head that we would pray for. Before us is a, a name on the church prayer list here. Claire Mary, who has issues with her feet, the warden and friend of grace. Remember Claire today, we pray, Heavenly Father. Meet her need. We thank you for all that she does, for all that the blessing she is. Lord, remember her. Lord, remember a name from last month, or a person from last month, Heather Tilson. Remember her in her situation. Leave now back at home, but still no doubt in need. Or different needs in our, our home. Lord, remember her. Remember the family. May help be available. We pray, Heavenly Father, in her situation. As we take a moment to think of others who are dear to us, who we, who we would bring to you in prayer. Let us take a moment to bring them before you. Lord, remember these ones, we pray, Heavenly Father. We pray for the work of missionaries throughout the world, in all countries, missionaries, societies, large and small. We think of 
Mission and Aviation Fellowship and the work that they do. That they can use these planes to get to places that would not be easily accessed. They can bring relief, they can bring the gospel, they can bring transport missioners, they can, as we say, transport relief, medicines. We'll keep them safe, keep them flying, we will pray. Answer their prayers, accept their praises. Lord, we still pray for Ukraine and that situation, that suffering that is going on. Sometimes we don't know how to pray. We don't really know perhaps what they're going through. When the sirens go off, when they hear the bomb blasts, Lord, we bring the situation to you, Heavenly Father. May it even somehow be a time of weakness, a time of, a time of prayer, a time of being thankful. But Lord, we know there is a time of needing comfort. Their loved ones are lost. Lord, remember Ukraine, we pray. Help us to be charitable when there is a need, or even when we don't perceive a need. May we have that giving heart. May we, <coughs> may we not just think about ourselves, but think what we can do, even if only in a small way. Lord, melt and mould our hearts to be like yours, Heavenly Father, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Another hymn. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him.
passage that we were reading we had today and what it made her do. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Do the efforts for perfume work? <laughs> Does the allure of the glamorous model, style, stylistic setting, persuade you to part, uh, part with cash for such a fragrance for your beloved or just yourself? Uh, what's missing from the advert? The actual aroma, of course. <laughs> we don't have smelly vision yet, but well, not yet. Over the years, have you settled on a fragrance? I wrote that here, whether it be just links Africa or some <laughs> other rather than the the ocean. In the old days, it was brute and old spice, I think. But uh, I recall going to an aunt to an aunt's funeral. <coughs> And the daughter, given a, given a eulogy, mentioned that uh, their mum had always, even in a, up to her old age, had a certain air and scent. It was a Chanel product. Perfume, ointment, even balm is something that has been made, produced throughout time. People with time on their hands have mixed or compounded ingredients together. Yes, have a nice aroma, but also do some good. Have a purpose. Soothe or smooth. Refresh or rejuvenate. For some mixtures, the scent was a byproduct, but nevertheless pleasant to the senses. You can even look at Exodus 30. 22 to 32, describing the anointing oil for the priest. As you scan the description, you're told the ingredients and the amounts. Liquid myrrh, fragrant cinnamon, fragrant cane, acacia, olive oil, to produce a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. But it wasn't to be for general use. 34 to 38 goes on. Another mixture or formula. Again, not for yourself or general use. Again, it says, consider it holy to the Lord. This time take fragrant spices, gum, resin, honica, galbanum, and pure frankincense, all in equal amounts. A fragrant blend of incense. The work of a perfumer, a perfumer, <coughs> salted, pure, and sacred. Proverbs 27 verse 9 says, the Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart. Yes, I suppose it's something that's been happening throughout history. Someone has the job, a perfumer. And as you would expect, Song of Solomon has references. For example, pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. But as with most things, perfumes can be misused or used for wrong beguiling purposes or, or even overindulged in. If you wanted to look them up, Isaiah 57 verse 9, Proverbs 7 verse 17, Amos 6 verse 6 gives examples of all of that. But why should an act of love involving perfume be mentioned with the gospel message? The good news from God, of God and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it should be mentioned according to Jesus. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached, says Jesus, throughout the world, 
what she has done will also be told in memory of her. I suppose I could have lit a scented candle, couldn't I? Let it waft around or press the spray can. But one person would have liked the aroma and one wouldn't. But perhaps I'll try and um, infuse the sermon with a bit of perfume, as it were. So you might have expected today that the arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem and all the all those years ago, the events that we would remember or call that we would call Palm Sunday would be the theme of this morning's message. Well, if it was, I'm sorry. Well, we did read that earlier and had a few thoughts. Jesus knew what lay before him. They say a week is a long time in politics, but for Jesus it was so much more. He knew the cross was before him, the pain and suffering, the anxiety and torment. It was why he came, it was why he was born. He would be that goodwill towards men, but at a cost. However, I thought for a change, I would look at this incident that is recorded for us of his last week. Jesus said a lot that week. He did a lot that week, teaching and healing, but also enjoying the hospitality of and from others. I don't know how you see uh, the week from Palm Sunday to Good Friday and then Easter, the rising from the dead. Whether you take more time reading the events, you take it on a, perhaps a true timeline, day by day, it's what you can do. But what did, what did our Palm Sunday, if we've read it from the Bible, say, rather than that paraphrase, I think, uh, it would have said this. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Bethany was not far from Jerusalem. The map I looked at had it about a couple of miles to the east or to the right hand side, a bolt hole, somewhere to stay overnight, away from the hustle and bustle of Jerusalem, the city, especially as more and more people arrive for the feast, festival of Passover and unleavened bread. Mary, Martha and Lazarus lived there, you'll remember. But in our reading we find he's being entertained at the home of Simon, Simon the leper. Simon, it would seem, was a popular name at the time, as names tend to be. They had their time of fashion, don't they? They didn't, in Bible times, or in, had surnames in quite the same way as we do. Or if they did, they weren't always used to name someone. One of the disciples was known as Simon the Zealot. Simon Peter was more often known as Peter, the Simon got dropped. Then later in Acts is a Simon the Tanner. So just to differentiate them, they have a little bit of something that happened to them or something associated with them. Just a quick aside, if the birth of our first child had turned out differently, you can work out what I mean there, then there would be a Bethany in our family, so Sarah Jane would say. We have Simon the leper. One assumes it was not contagious, or well, it's not a contagious form he had. Perhaps it had affected his skin, but was, perhaps he was now cured. So we have the incident that we read one of several groups or characters of people's thinking, 
attitudes heart and their hearts revealed one that set things in motion for the next few days something said perhaps some un unexpected, unexpected things said and a significant act of love and devotion never to be forgotten what's the sense of it or excuse the pun what's the scent of it once again jesus didn't act or say what was the norm or as expected to so as a speaker studying this passage you ask yourself is there a practical side to come out of it is there a spiritual side to come out of it you ask yourself have i really seen it or have i missed the point or left it to another speaker to bring out another time let's go through it let's set the scene the teachers of the law the chief priests were looking for some way to arrest jesus get him off the scene remove him from the picture silence him how they wanted him killed they wanted him dead i assume some of these were pharisees there was hatred towards jesus do you remember some of the story we looked at last time i spoke jesus was getting to them and mark 3 verse 6 then the pharisees went out and began to plot with the herodians how they might kill jesus i suppose two or three years have now passed and those opposed to jesus and his teaching were still trying to plot to reach their aim how could they get hold of jesus get him on their ground under their jurisdiction jesus was out and about in public places what had the people asserted though only recently that jesus of nazareth was a prophet he had been doing marvelous things healing them the, blind, the lame walked the blind eyes were made to see jesus was doing what he did doing good a man of the people the people wouldn't let jesus be taken right in front of them they would have a riot on their hands we know jesus had publicly told the pharisees what he thought of them and they were not going to forget it though they were religious men for example luke 16 verses 13 to 14. And this is how the niv translates it no servant can serve two masters either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve both god and money the pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at jesus he said to them you are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of men but god knows your hearts what is highly valued among men is detestable in god's sight what does it say in mark 15 verse 10 Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to them. How could they get him back? Well, because of, and then let's call it a fumigate, Jesus gets handed to, on a plate to them. Somebody else in the story loved money. Judas Iscariot. Was it the apparent waste of money with the perfume? Was that the motive? But verse 10, then Jesus Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. What did it say? They were delighted and promised him money. 30 pieces of silver. So Jesus looked for an, an opportunity which came quite quickly. In fact, in the same chapter 14, to get Jesus, he got Jesus into a situation where he could be handed over and arrested 
with the money reward is. Yes, let's refresh ourselves of the story bookended by that plot and the betrayal. Jesus is enjoying the hospitality of Simon the leper, reclining at the table. Not something perhaps that we can appreciate or can fully appreciate as we don't eat or commune like that. Nearest perhaps is a picnic where we might sit down on the floor. But I would think it would be terribly uncomfortable. I suppose once you're used to it and it's the done thing, you eat like that or commune like that. No doubt, pleasant conversation was being had past the time or expression an opinion or discussion. Then suddenly, a woman is there. She pours some perfume from the jar. No, all the contents, it says on his head. The fragrance fills the room. Some liked it, some find it offensive. Jesus could see it for what it was. He called it a beautiful thing done out of love and devotion. The others saw it, saw it as a complete waste of money and should not be commended. This event is not a case study of, on the use of money or extravagant use of money or not just being, or not just be concerned for the poor. You get that main theme teaching elsewhere. In fact, even Chapter 13, we have the witnessing of the example of the widow's offering. Not the value, but the giving of all. If you were chapters earlier, chapter 10, the, the rich young man and Jesus' advice for this man. It says, he looked at him, loved him. One thing you lack, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven then come, follow me. Back to our story. Yes, Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. And you can help them any time you want. Going back on, on having said all that, I suppose you could well say that as Jesus is no longer with us, the message is, yes, the poor you always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, as I'm sure you do. What should we see, though, from what this woman did? What will be remembered alongside the Gospel in memory of her, not to be forgotten? This perfume it speaks of Jesus' burial and thus his death. No ordinary death, no meaningless death, but death, a death that brought, that brought and brought us life, forgiveness of our sins, justification, sanctification, reconciliation with the Father. If I can put it like this, this death it deserved a decent burial. In reality, it was in some ways a hurried burial for Jesus. We can read it at the end of Mark 15. Though John's Gospel goes on to say that Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus did have time to apply a mixture of myrrh and aloes. Luke says the women went home to prepare spices and perfumes in that Mark 10 tells us, ready for after the Sabbath, they rest, intending to anoint Jesus' body, wondering who, would roll, wondering who would roll the stone away from the entrance. Was anything routine with Jesus? He was given this anointing preparation before his burial. He said it was a beautiful thing. Or he said, it was a beautiful thing to me. Let's just consider its cost. 
this alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. I haven't got a clue what that was, or what it looked like, or what it smelled like. But, uh, but there we go. But we spoke of the indignation, the reckless act, the waste of perfume, the waste of money. That's being man's perspective. But Jesus saw it differently. Look at its equivalent cost. Now, I don't know whether this woman was an expert perfumer herself who had extracted or just used pure nard in its making, or whether she had saved and bought it. Whatever it cost or was worth a lot. To put the cost or value into understandable measures uh, described, where we saw it described as more than a year's wages. Now the footnote in the NRV says gives it as cost as 300 denarii, or the King James, 300 pence. Now 300 pence doesn't sound a lot to us, does it? But inflation and all that. Do you remember the parable of the workers in the vineyard? Whatever time they were hired, they all got the same pay. Matthew 20. And if you're here tonight, I think you're going to have more of that um, from Norman. What was the wage they were going to get for a day's work? One pence. One denarii. So with 365 days in a year, less Sabbaths, it's a bit more than 300 days, hence a year's wage. To keep it simple, if we said that the minimum wage today was £10 an hour, for 40 hours a week would be £400. For 50 weeks a year, that comes to £20,000. The woman had £20,000 worth of perfume in that jar. And it would seem she extravagantly poured it all out in one go on Jesus. There and then. Yes, to, that, to us it does sound and look extravagant as you visualise it. But can you smell the love, devotion, honour, adoration, affection, esteem the woman had for Jesus? Ecclesiastes 7 verse 2 says this in the way that Ecclesiastes tends to put things. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Jesus said, she poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. For his body that would suffer so much in my place in your place. What does Isaiah say about his suffering? You might expect me to quote from Isaiah 53 to explain why such a costly perfume for his burial after his costly death for his costly death. But I saw some verses in chapter 1 of Isaiah now out of context here, or as I'm going to show them, describe it well. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness only wounds and bruises and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. That sums up Jesus' suffering. Why, why such a death? Verse 4 would have told us, they had forsaken the Lord, turned their backs on him, 
our sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. As we go through the week, ponder the events, the whys, the significance, remember for whatever or whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It means so much. It means all. Amen. What does Jesus mean to you? Will I not tell dear, built my life upon? All this world to gears and wars to own? Will I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now compared to this?